This week on Capital Report. Tired of high grocery prices? So are lawmakers. But who's to blame? Grocery stores have made a mess on aisle five. And we need the attorney general to help us clean it up. Their policies uh, and their president has driven costs up for consumers. Plus, pro-Palestinian activists demand a ceasefire or face consequences. Our message to them is that they have to hear us, they have to listen to us. Words matter. The heated debate over language in a bill describing someone who's pregnant. My children call me mother, mom, mom. Pregnant persons is recognizing that there are a variety of ways that people identify. And UConn does it again. But can the state afford to keep the coach? I pay for success. Let's dance. Capital Report starts now. Welcome to Capital Report. I am Tom Dutchick. We're glad you're spending part of this Master Sunday alongside the Power Panel. Don't get that pimento cheese sandwiches yet, guys. We've got a lot to do alongside <laughs> Joe Arasimowitz. How's your golfing game these days? Terrible. Terrible. <laughs> Just terrible. That, that's right. You don't golf, do you? I Liz, don't. Liz no. I like to watch golf. Johnny Mack's a good golfer. I wore my Master's green. Uh, right. It's a great Sunday Joe, Master's We'll, we'll get this Sunday. cerulean later. He's the scratch golfer here, guys. Right? <laughs> All right, so tired of sky-high grocery prices? Who isn't? So last week, Democratic leaders, including the Attorney General, demanded major grocery retailers disclosed their profits and costs. They point to an FTC investigation at the increasing prices for groceries since the pandemic. Well, the result of stores increasing revenue and not by inflation. Watch this. And all you got to do is spend five minutes outside a grocery store and ask every consumer coming out of that store whether they've seen prices come down. They'll probably tell you no. And, that, and, and as the FTC report said, uh, a lot of the, the profits are up. And while other supply chains issues have come down and prices have come down, those have not. And we see it in, in the results of the, of the profits and how that's pushing inflation. We encourage uh, legislators on both sides of the aisle to join us in this effort, right? Who's for price gouging? Nobody, I hope. It was definitely hairspray on Duff, hey. So Republicans' leaders think they know why grocery prices are surging. Here's a hint. He lives in a big white house with cones. Watch this. There's nothing to investigate other than their policies are causing costs to go up, period. President Biden and his administration has not controlled inflation, and the Connecticut Democrats uh, have implemented countless policies, countless taxes uh, for a generation now that has driven up costs for consumers here in Connecticut. So you don't need to send the attorney general in to investigate any of that. It is their policies that have caused this. Guys, let's talk about here. It occurs to me these politicians weren't complaining about grocery stores being open during the pandemic when they were the only thing open feeding families, guys. Yeah, I mean, we all did appreciate the hard work, the dedication that they were there. It was weird hours. We'd all go in our masks, but they were there. They were comparable to the frontline workers. I'm glad uh, Senator Duff brought this up. It should be looked at, but I've sat through multiple public hearings, especially last year, and the biggest margins really are on the prepared foods where they're comparing equally with restaurants. That's where the larger margins are at the grocery stores. Anything else? Should we figure it out if it's supply issue or greed? Yes, let's figure it out. You mean those prepared foods that those Democrats taxed? Do you remember when they yeah, accidentally <laughs> taxed groceries? Oops. I mean, this is ridiculous. This is probably, in my view, one of the most dangerous and irresponsible things that the attorney general has ever done. They went up there and they accused small businesses, privately owned small businesses in Connecticut of gouging without a single shred of evidence. They have no data. This is a top-down political argument generated out of Washington, D.C. to try and provide cover to Joe Biden in an election that he is losing and losing badly on these financial issues. We have a gas tax. We have the hut tax. We have paid leave, we have a higher minimum wage, go talk to your grocery store owners and ask them what their profits look like, what running their business looks like, you are not going to like the answer. And I, that's my challenge to the Attorney General and Senator Duff. Yeah, I mean, I have some experience in the food business. Um, there are usually formulaic margins for mm -hmm. different sections within your grocery store. Those margins really don't vary. Uh, when prices go up, your margin is uh, your, your margin's the same, but you're making more because prices are up. Um, we've seen prices go up 
throughout the entire chain. I think the problem here is, and I'm not opposed to any investigation, nobody's for price gouging to answer the Attorney General, and he's a smart guy. But you now have to believe that Walmart, Amazon, Stop and Shop, Safeway, Whole Foods, and small independent grocers are all colluding together because they're all charging the same prices. It doesn't make sense. There isn't evidence. I look forward to seeing if there is any. Your experience, you were a bagger when you were 12 years old. That's what <laughs> hey, so as Muslims marked the end of the holy month of Ramadan last week, many gathered at the Excel Center for what's normally a time of celebration. But as Israel continues its war in Gaza against Hamas, there was a much more somber tone. Emotions were subdued. And this year, well, there were a few attendees who didn't get the invite, most notably Governor Lamont. We're not asking people to pick sides. Uh, this is not a Muslim or a Jewish issue. This is a humanitarian issue at this point. Um, just as we would ask for a ceasefire if there was a war uh, in any other part of the country where uh, innocent people, men, women, and children are being butchered mercilessly, uh, we would want them to be vocal about a ceasefire and again look for a political solution uh, to, this, uh, to this issue rather than try to solve it by force. It was also a pro-Palestinian rally at the Capitol last Wednesday where protesters called on state leaders to demand a ceasefire or face political repercussions. Watch this. Our message to them is that they have to hear us, they have to listen to us. This is a genocide, this is apartheid, this has been going on for the past 75 years, there's no end in sight. Yes, President Biden wants a ceasefire, I want a ceasefire, I want it tied to a returning of the hostages and humanitarian aid. I have somebody who's been to Gaza City a couple of times and I see the suffering of those people, but the three have got to be tied together. Panel's giving Ned, Ned a thumbs up on that one, Johnny Mac, huh? Yes, because he's tied a ceasefire to a return of the hostages. President Biden came out the other day and asked for a six to eight week ceasefire without mentioning the hostages. We have American hostages. And the President of the United States isn't calling for their return in exchange for a ceasefire. To me, that is maybe one of the worst things any president has ever done. I just want to say one more thing. This is not a genocide. People can say it's a genocide. They don't know what a genocide is. This is not the intentional targeting of civilians. The reason why civilians are dying in Gaza is because Hamas is using them as human shields. And I've said it before, I'll say it till it's over, and I hope it's over soon. Return the hostages, dead or alive, because most of them are probably dead now, and Hamas is lying about that. Hamas surrenders, there's no war. Yeah, and, and, and I uh, associate my thoughts with Governor Lamont and sitting with him publicly and privately. You know, when he talks about the Gaza Strip, when he talks about Palestine, he's been there. He met the kids. His heart is bleeding for this. It really does upset him. He wants to do as much as we can. But you're right, John. The ceasefire needs to happen. I think that's what everybody wants, peace in the region. But also those hostages have to come home. They're in cages. They're in bunkers. They're in caves. It's now been, what, 190 plus days these people have been separated from their family? have to do something immediately. All right, guys, we'll save Liz for this one. There's never a shortage of excitement at the Capitol. Recently, a House bill came before the Appropriations <laughs> Committee titled an act concerning mental health for young children and their caregivers. And often at the Capitol, it's not the bill, but the language within a bill, as Arison was knows, that gets lawmakers all fired up. First, hats off to lawmakers for actually scrutinizing these bills. I must digress here, though. The issue here was with the term, get this, guys, pregnant persons or birthing parents being used in the bill, which some viewed as all-inclusive language. Take a listen to State Rep. Robin Porter, who pushed to change the language to expectant mothers. What is this? I, as a woman with a womb, identify as an expectant mother, um, and so will other women that don't identify as the people being categorized under the pregnant persons. So this is the reason for the amendment, and I'm hoping that this will be received as a friendly amendment so that we can really do the work of what we talk about when we speak on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Pregnant persons is recognizing that there are a variety of ways that people identify. And so it is a shame to me that we are having this conversation. I myself am a mother, and at the end of the day, my children will continue to call me mother, regardless of the term we put into this statute. But pregnant persons is intended to be inclusive of all 
folks who have the capacity to get pregnant. My children call me mother, ma, mommy, depends on the day, right? But something along those lines, and that is what I answer to. I don't answer to pregnant person or birthing person. That's not what I answer to. And a, a huge part of my identity is wrapped around being a mother and a grandmother. The amendment passed 32 to 16 to change the language from pregnant persons to expectant mothers. And well, if you ever watch your kids play t-ball, we have set one on the tee for Liz. <laughs> <laughs> Um, gratefully not watching T-ball anymore. <laughs> um, I, this is probably the most ludicru ludicrous uh, uh, gymnastics of, of language we have ever seen in legislation. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with Robin Porter. Um, this is inclusion by exclusion. And I, I'm glad that the amendment uh, to include expectant mothers, this is really important. As, uh, as the representative said, I'm a mom. That is the greatest title that mm -hmm. I will ever have. And I am eternally <clears throat> grateful um, that, I, that I have that title. And when I was pregnant, uh, all three times, I was an expectant mother. I am very grateful for the two children that I have. Um, and so be, to be an expectant mom is something um, and we have to identify that for what it is, period. Yeah. Why do we have to do this? Well, and, and look, I think the intention of when you hear Representative Gilchrist, the intention is to include everybody. And that's a good intention. We should include everybody. I'm an ally of the LGBTQ plus community. But you can't be an ally and bring someone up by erasing others. Let's include everybody, but don't take people out. I think people ask me all the time, number one question is, what were the caucuses like? Well, in this particular instance, you witnessed it live on camera for folks. But those are the type of discussions we had on a daily basis in caucus, because you are. You're trying to be inclusive. You're not trying to exclude people. You're trying to find the right title. But that was, that was what happens all the time. And it, it worked its way out. I think walking away, people are upset on the losing side. But the folks on the winning side have the language they feel comfortable with. That's how the bill will move forward. All right, guys, up next on Cap Report, forget about the 2024 election. We're going to jump ahead to 2026. News Aid's political contributor, Mike Cerulli, he's looking into his crystal ball. We'll chat with him, a scratch golfer. When we return, don't get away. He'll go away, guys. Oh. of Governor Lamont. So you have to settle for me, but the good news is I am the governor because the governor is out of state. Uh, Lieutenant Governor rallying at the University of New Haven with members of Local 217 Unite here. So is there some big picture significance behind all this? Joining us to further explain it is News 8's political contributor Mike Cerulli on Master Sunday. Mike, cut right to it. Are we watching the start of the 2026 race? Yeah, good morning, Tom. You know, I would actually say that that 2026 race has already started in a way. Susan Beisowitz was out there rallying with organized labor. She knows that the road to the Democratic nomination runs squarely through New Haven. And she's been running a sort of shadow campaign for some time now, lining up the support of future delegates to the state convention. She's also raised a boatload of money, more than $100,000 last quarter alone. You know, of course, all this talk about 26 is dependent on the current governor not running again. Governor Lamont has still not publicly indicated what he's going to do, but he's popular and he'd be well positioned for a third term. Still, other Democrats certainly lining up. Okay, Mike, why don't you break down the rest of the potential 2026 Democratic field for us? Give us a handicap of their strengths. Certainly, in addition to Bicewitz, there are uh, three other names, Mike, huh? Yeah, those three names we hear when you talk to insiders, pretty common. Attorney General William Tong, former Hartford Mayor Luke Bronin and State Comptroller Sean Scanlon. All three of those men are working behind the scenes to varying degrees to gauge and secure support. Tong's biggest strength, probably the strength of his office, the platform of his office. He's highly visible, he's vocal, and he's taken action on pretty much every major issue out there. Luke Bronin, he'd lean heavily on his experience 
He's been chief executive of a city. He served in the military. Those credentials resonate with the people who will decide the nomination. And as for Sean Scanlon, he really represents that younger generation of Democratic leaders. He's carved out a niche for himself on health care policy. And crucially, he's very savvy on social media. Reaching voters in 2026 is going to be a major challenge for candidates who are used to more traditional media platforms. So you can't underestimate the importance of building a presence on those platforms now. Great rundown, Mike. I can see the panel's all riled up, guys. Let's have a discussion. Uh, Danielle, um, no person of color on that list, sadly, no, huh? No person of color, but speaking of 2026ers, I attended a campaign kickoff for uh, a Democratic uh, Steve King in South Windsor. He's running for the 14th House District. And all of the 2026ers, uh, you know, most of them showed up, spoke, and addressed the politicos of South Windsor. Including so, yourself. Incl <laughs> <laughs> Let's get the so Republicans, started. Republicans, who do you got? I, I mean, Caroline Simmons wasn't on that list. Um, I think, obviously, Aaron Stewart is a front runner on the Republican side in terms of somebody who we know is definitely going to get in. Um, you know, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Vin Candelora, obviously a leader in the legislature with a story to tell. I think wild cards on the Republican side, Kevin Kelly from Stratford, middle class up roots, talks about the middle class all the time. Rob Sampson, he's been the voice of the, of the right or the far right of the Republicans. There's going to be pressure to see, hey, this is how we should act as Connecticut Republicans. Joe, Dark Horse. Dark Horse, look, you can't leave Matt Ritter's name out, out of the conversation. He's now been speaker on this, going on his second term. He's been an effective leader, works in a bipartisan way. It has to at least be mentioned in that discussion. One more message. Governor Lamont, run again. Republicans. Wait till 2030. I like it. He changes everything, the entire dynamic of the of the potential. I, race. I think you'll see Republicans for Lamont if he says he's doing a third term. Oh, there you go, Johnny Mac. All right. <laughs> All right, guys, UConn national champions yet again. What does winning the title mean for the state's flagship university? Let's just say money's involved. Details, we get back. Do not go away. In case you've been visiting distant galaxies, UConn won the NCAA men's basketball title last Monday for the sixth time. Coach Danny Hurley and the team doing it back to back. When it comes to pay, on the other hand, Hurley gets $5 million per year along with another million and a half or so in performance bonuses. And you can bet UConn will need to shell out a lot more to keep Hurley in stores. Simple enough, Hurley deserves it. Pay the man, right? But before you do that, let's just remember a few months ago, UConn's president went before the legislature to beg for an additional 40 Seven million dollars in funding, guys. We have fiscal guardrails in the state. They're going to back the truck up to Danny Hurley, uh, uh, your your pal Ritter, who's uh, <laughs> is going to be. I think they're going to be coming after him, Joe. Huh? Look, you're going to pay the man what he's worth. What he's done for UConn, Connecticut as a whole, and the UConn basket pro basketball program is amazing. He brought us back to where we, we had been not too long ago, but it was at risk of falling apart. The whole switch from the American Conference back to the Big East played into his nature. He's an East Coast guy. We saw Kentucky trying to woo him. I'm sure there was a lot of dollar sounds there, signs there. But Ned Lamont said it perfectly. I pay for success. And if you do, it's back-to-back -back championships. Hasn't happened since well, they, Florida. Well, they paid Kevin Ollie a lot of money, not the coach. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Listen, it's big-time sports. This is what it is. You got to separate this from the UConn budget and the state budget. It, it just is what it is. The men had a great year back-to-back. -back. He deserves a new contract. Um, and just also a shout out to Gino and the women's team. Yeah. They had an amazing year, decimated with injuries. Just a, maybe his best coaching job ever. Yeah, we're talking about um, pride, not mega pride, right? Yeah. And and bringing cost-benefit analysis into the conversation as well. What is the benefit of, of this? And we do find that uh, the basketball program does bring in some revenues, right? And so they it pays for itself in some ways. So we have to take that into account when we're talking about allocating more resources to a uh, brand Connecticut in general. So I think it's a it's a wonderful idea. That's exactly right. And the contribution that they've made to the state as a whole, but also to the city of Hartford, and the excitement that that brings, and how positive that is for the economic vibrancy of Hartford's downtown. That's really critical. And, and look, when something is revenue positive, you want to continue it and you want yeah. to grow it. What they can't do anything about, and what Dan Hurley can't do anything about, is how fiscally irresponsible UConn has been. And the fact that, that the university as a whole is saddled with fringe benefits that are continuously costing them more money than their competitors around the country. And that's really important when you're looking at this, when you're trying to compete talent with for talent in the athletic program. And, and in research.
research and development. And Joe, how, how does the Excel Center factor in this? And Gamble Pavilion is getting close to its useful life expectancy? You know? Yeah, there's going to be some major investments. Yeah. To get the recruits to come in, you have to have the, the facilities. And UConn has some of the best facilities in the country. But then you walk into the arenas they play, and they're falling behind. Um, I know Speaker Ritter and others, the Hartford Legislative Group, have really pushed for the improvements. I think there was $110 million going in now. The number probably is $300 million. That money will come, too, because, look, they're our team. It's our XL Center. Go Huskies. All right, guys, making the most of the Final Four as only the Nedster can do. We party with His Excellency. We get back. Do not go away, guys, right? You. Yeah, you got to listen to this. Stuff. Great for go ahead. One of the great things about being the governor of Connecticut is you get to bask in all of the UConn basketball glory, attend the Final Four. Governor Lamont was in both Cleveland and Arizona last weekend, and clearly the Gov was having a good time. Here he is dancing with Jonathan, the Husky, and you know he was also a part of the High Five line as the team boarded the bus. Sports team eights. John Pearson even asked him this question. Watch this. Can you give us your best Dan Hurley face? <laughs> That's not bad. That's not bad. He did, he did a good job, guys, huh? What do you think of that one, like guys, huh? I like that face on huh? Yeah, yeah. Look, as long head. as he's not making that face when the session ends, I think we're okay. <laughs> he but... might make that face when he's watching the show. <laughs> oh. uh, well, he... I'm more concerned about his dancing, too. Yeah, well, he's that was good. He's, you know, he he's puts himself up. out there, John. He makes himself vulnerable. How can you not appreciate that? He was on that? beat. He was on beat. <laughs> it's Number the one spin. booster of the state of Connecticut, the Gov, huh? You so, gotta be. I'm, uh, Bice was just gonna dance at the parade. <laughs> oh, fourth F for the mayor, the coach, Lizzie, Jay Mack of the Jackson Swing. Oh,